Welcome back to Radio Entrepreneurs. I'm Jonathan Friedman, and we are coming to you live from Startup Boston Week at Suffolk University. Our next guest in the Radio Entrepreneur studio is Joshin Lin, founder and CEO of Groby. Welcome to Radio Entrepreneurs. I am so excited to be here. So tell our listeners a little about your company and what it is that you do. Sure. So Groby, our mission is to unlock career success for international students through the power of networking. And so I built this company because this was an experience from my own. So I was once an international student about 12 years ago, and I wanted to get a job in the U.S. I first started to apply things online, but only realized nobody wanted to talk to me. And I went to my professor, I asked, so what can I do? He's like, you should go network. I was like, I have a Wi-Fi on my computer. Is that the type of network you're talking about? He's like, no, Josh, and you need to build your personal network, talk to people, get coffee, chats, and if they like you, they'll refer you. So uh, an idea was born based on necessity, right? You wanted yes. to find yourself a job. So tell us, fast forward from the conception to the build out of, of Groby and, and uh, who the marketplace that you service. Yeah. International students is a very broad term. Sure. Yeah. So, you know, I didn't knew that I could be an entrepreneur out of college. So I pursue a typical career where I was working in investment banking, transitioned to consulting, tech, went to a business school, and I was like, whew, I'm finally ready. So I actually started Groby in 2022 during my time at Harvard Business School, and now I've been working on it full-time for close to two years now. In terms of the audience that we are targeting, so yes, international students, but we do have a very particular beachhead market that we're serving, which are the Chinese international students. And we picked that segment for three specific reasons. Number one, I'm Chinese myself. And so, so much of things we're talking about is cultural differences. And so I'm able to really address the need uh, in that market. The second thing is the size. We like to talk about market size. So it's the number of the Chinese students that is actually the biggest group and also the ability and wins to pay for coaching. Mm-hmm. So tell us what the model is. So it's a subscription-based model where people sign up for the platform and then they are assigned to somebody, they gravitate towards somebody, you have resources uh, available, what all of the above. So subscription is actually our 2.0 model. Right now, we are actually running a networking bootcamp. So just like how you learn how to code, you come here to Groby and you learn how to network. So right now, it, our bootcamp runs about a month plus a lifelong community. So when I say it's 2 point, because we do plan to roll out a subscription model for our community, but we want to wait a little bit until we really build out our community base. So right now, it's just monetizing off that bootcamp. Okay, so how the boot camp, as you said, is a month long process. So that's right. W- what's what's the sort of time commitment for a student? Yeah, so our boot camp is all virtual. It's a combination of live classes, industry panels, recording. So on average, our students spend about an hour per day to learn about our content and programming. Now, um, when they graduate from the boot camp, and I would imagine that part of the model is to give them practical. Uh, skills so they can go. Right. So are you encouraging them along the way to get out into the marketplace and apply the skills that they learned on a regular basis? So you're sort of applying the coaching model? A hundred percent. So actually, as part of our bootcamp, practice is such an important part of it. So we have those like mock sessions where we have them to talk to native speakers and we also provide feedback to them during those mock sessions so they can be better. There are a few matrix we're tracking. One is in terms of the skill improvement, right? So we look at two big things. One is how courageous they have become before and after bootcamp in reaching out to strangers. And the second thing is how confident they become before and after the bootcamp in talking to strangers. So uh, courage and confidence are two key matrix we're tracking. I'm curious how you're measuring those. So we actually asked them uh, in our survey. So before the boot camp, we actually run a survey as on a scale of one to ten, how uh, courageous uh, you are on reaching out to a stranger. So usually the average score is about four point out of ten. After boot camp, we're looking at eight, sometimes nine out of ten, and we did that in one mm. month. Something we are very proud of. Tremendous. The other thing that we track is actually their offer rate, because I talk about that networking as a key tool to land a job here in the U.S. And so we actually about. Uh, we actually have about 50 to 60% offer rate from our students anywhere between three to six months after graduating from our program and it's something that we, again, are very proud of. And so combine those matrix together, we have a phenomenal net promoter score of 85 and that really keep our community strong and the referral going. That's wonderful. So what are some of the key hurdles that, um, and you said predominantly uh, Chinese um, uh, national uh, students coming to the U.S., what are some of the key hurdles that they face? I I would imagine a a significant cultural hurdle is um, uh, the fact that uh, in the U.S. you can talk to anybody in the street. 
um, in China, it's probably not as common. No, um, not at all. And and uh, people are uh, brought up in an environment where they're focused on themselves or focused on on, on not looking around. So how, how do you quickly, in a relatively short period of time, even though they've come through the educational process in, in a U.S. institution, how do you get them to get comfortable with that? Because so yeah. you, you're talking about behavioral change. Exactly. You, you really brought up a really good point. And so, you know, one of the things that we did in the first session of our boot camp is to discuss openly about fears in networking, right? So there's a phrase that therapists like to use is, if you can name it, you can tame it. So what are some of the top fears that they have? Number one is language barrier. Uh, more specifically, is they think they have a language barrier. But you know the students we attract, they come from some of the best schools, like Harvard, MIT, BU, BC, right here in Boston. They're it's not much of a barrier if they've gone through four years of schooling. And I mean, their yeah. TOEFL score is like more than 100 points out of yeah. 120, so they're very fluent in their English. But it's really more the mental block, if you will. They think that, oh, I might not understand what Jonathan's saying. Oh, wait, I, I can't really articulate it myself. It's really about that mental block they had. So that's one big part. The other thing is thinking that reaching out to a stranger is just such a weird thing. And I would argue, to your point, Jonathan, such an American thing that like you would just go out to a stranger and say hi and people want to get coffee with you. You're like, what? Right? And, and so it's very different. And so I think calling doesn't exist in China? Not really. <laughs> I mean, you, you got to really have a reference to go around. And so how we have done it are, are the few things, right? So one is that we talk about our fears and address them. The second thing is that we actually have a lot of role models coming into our classroom. And part of those role models are, you know, the native speaker who come in and interact with you and really help you to understand that this is part of the culture. That's how people small talk here. This is how it, uh, we network here. And so by putting them through repetition of practice, they start to get it. Um, so that's how we've done it. Do envision expansion beyond the U.S.? For sure. Indeed, we actually have students from over 10 countries. So U.S. is our big base, but uh, you can imagine any other English-speaking country such as Canada, our close neighbors, U.K., Australia. So those are what we call the big four, uh, our key targets. But we also have students coming from Greece, Germany, Korea, Japan. Like We actually have students from uh, over 10 countries now, which is something that's very exciting. Hmm. And I would imagine that the the um, uh, hurdles are the same, irrespective of where they're coming from. The cultures are different. The uh, approaches are different. Um, the skill that you're teaching is one that is not often taught within the college environment or that's at right. least in the in the scholastic environment. That's right. Um, you know, I know that uh, there there are forms sometimes run within placement offices. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, career counseling, things mm -hmm. of that nature. Um, how do you uh, how do you find your students? How do you bring them into the fold? How do you make them aware of Groby? What's what's, yeah. what's the hook? So our key. So one thing I'm actually really proud to share is that we actually have about about a thousand paying customers, and we spend zero dollar in ad. And the secret that we're able to do it is actually through social media and content marketing, right? So we spend a lot of effort to build an organic following by the content. But how do you know what content speaks to your customers? Because we know the customers so well, right? Because we're talking about a personal experience that I've went through. I know exactly what was the hurdles for me uh, when I was trying to network when I was a freshman back in college. And so we create those social media content uh, on social media platforms such as Little Red Book, predominantly uh, our Ch Chinese audience, to really speak to them. We also go on live streams. Um, every time we have a live stream, we are able to generate quite some new um, leads coming to our pipeline. We also work with student association on campus, career centers. So we basically build content and strategic partnerships to find our customers. And uh, in terms of the um, geographic uh, mix, you talked a lot about uh, schools in the Boston area, but are you are you targeting schools all over the country? Are you all over the U.S.? We actually how many foreign students are there currently enrolled in U.S. Colleges. Every year, we're looking at about one million. Okay, so that's a significant population. Yeah, and yeah. one third of them are Chinese. And what percentage of those return back to their home countries? So that's a great question. Every year, the number fluctuates, but I would say 80% of the students want to stay in the U.S., but I would say only probably about less than half get to stay due to various uh, reasons. So you're still talking four to 500,000? For sure. As a potential market. But we also think that networking is a lifelong skill that one needs to acquire beyond mm -hmm. getting the job, right? It's something that you take away with you um, and as an important uh, driver for your career progression. It's just their first job, right? There may be more. So. And that's why we like to start early, meeting our customer when they're a student. And our motto is that in our membership, we want to build up, it will be a more of a lifelong career development with them. Now you get a job, 
the next thing you're thinking, how do I get my first promotion? How do I pay my career? How about business school? And grow we want to be with them every single step of their career development. So looking back on your own startup journey, um, what are some of the lessons uh, that you learned along the way that you wish somebody would have told you prior to uh, launching? It's really hard. I mean, I mean, I, this, I know this sounds so obvious, but like, I feel like the difficulty comes in as a founder, you really have to be in a way jack of all trades. You just kind of have to know a little bit of everything, even though sometimes that um, area might be something that you don't know or something you are uncomfortable with, right? But I think it's important to understand your own um, limitations, if you will, and be able to network with the right people, hire the right people to help you to fill that gap. And so that's one. And I think the other thing kind of Yes, it's a difficult job, but it's also super rewarding. And I think it's important to take care of oneself from a well-being perspective, having a support network. Um, and I think that I wish that people tell me about it. Uh, striking that work-life integration, not so much balance, I don't think, uh, is something I wish I knew earlier. Well, the beauty of technology is you can fit it into your lifestyle, whatever that is, right? You access but then you're the always on, so like, are you really oh, true. resting? <laughs> true. No, yeah, absolutely great point. Josh and Lynn, uh, if people want to reach out to you, learn more about Groby, talk to you, uh, what's the best way for them to reach out to you? Yes, uh, I am on LinkedIn. Follow me on LinkedIn. Or you can find me on Little Red Book. Uh, uh, also, Josh and same name. Excellent. Josh and Lynn, founder and CEO of Groby. It's been a pleasure having you on Radio Entrepreneurs. Thank you, Jonathan. It's been lovely. And we'll be right back with another segment of Radio Entrepreneurs coming to you from Startup Boston at Suffolk University.